Okay, hands off the keyboard. I get too excited with these things. The only thing we need to close out of is the YouTube when it pops up because I hate hearing myself talk. Yes, okay, we did it. We're not touching, we're not touching. Okay, uh, anyone with access? Yes, I do consent to being live streamed. That's why I set that up. All right, so, hey folks, how are you doing? It's quiz time. So go ahead, um, and I do notice that a couple of people aren't here. Um, and so if you are not here, what I will do when I um, send this link to you to access this after the stream is over, uh, what I'll be doing is emailing you the quiz so that you can get that to me too. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and hand these out, change the lighting. I will probably give you about 10 minutes. This shouldn't be too hard. And then we'll go over it as a class. All right. Don't forget to check the back. I made so many cookies. I love that we have a copy machine like out in the hallway now, so I don't have to walk all the way to the faculty in the old room. Although I did get a very lovely gift card to Precision for helping out Dr. Quick and giving her gifts of bread and cake after her injury and pizza. Lots of dominoes. <laughs> Sometimes when you hurt your arm, the last thing you want to do is cook for everybody. All right, so it's 2.33, so at 2.43, we'll come back into the class and go over the quiz. If you need more time, you can let me know. Sorry. <laughs> I forgot my flash drive. I will be right back.
right? You have about five minutes left. No hurry. I mean, kind of hurry, but not too much hurry. Yeah, if you're finished already, you can look on your phone or other things for a few minutes. I won't tell anybody. <laughs> Anybody need some more time? No? I see a few people over here looking, so I'll wait a bit. Joanne, do you need more time? Okay. Stella, you good? Everybody good? All right. Are we ready to go over these? Okay. Let's go ahead and do that. So um, question number one, suppose that you wanted to understand attitudes about voters in your state or province. For this population, which of these would represent random sampling? So what did you all put? put you put D? Okay, if you pick D, um, you would, yeah, you'd probably want D in that instance. Now I know what gets, what even just looking at this, when you said D, I looked at it like 10 people. But remember that the method of how you select your participants is probably gonna be more important than how many you select. So remember that if you want to get a representative sample, you need to have a list of all people in that population. It's why for part of the reason when I do my cognitive psychology studies, I can't actually do random sampling because we're looking at people in general. Good luck trying to get a registered list of all people in general. It's very, very difficult. Um, so the correct answer in that case would definitely be D. Don't be fooled by the small number of participants. The selection is what's critical. Okay, number two, non-experimental research does not have a manipulated variable, cannot, account, cannot control for possible confounds, does not allow causal conclusions to be drawn or all of the above. All of the above, good job. All right, in statistical inference, what is the correct answer? It is B. A sample statistic is used to estimate a population parameter. Remember that parameters always describe populations. So for example, that would be something like mu, and no, not the new variant of concern, 
It's really not going to be that bad, I hope. Um, but mu as in the population average. Now, you don't know what mu is in this instance. So we use a sample statistic to estimate and serve as a stand-in for what we think that mu might be. So the correct answer for that one is B. We use sample statistics to estimate population parameters. Yes, Julia. Um, you were saying not to use X bar. Would that be the sample statistic? X bar or, or M would be your sample statistic. Mu would be your parameter. So our parameters are always going to be in Greek. Now, it gets a little bit more complicated sometimes. So for example, because sometimes some of the terms we use are Greek. So when we talk, but in general, when we talk about populations, we're always going to use Greek. So the correlation coefficient for a sample is R. For a population, we use rho, which is the Greek for R. For an effect size, we use D. But if we're talking about that effect in the population, we call it delta. So we're always going to use Greek. For our parameters, we're always going to use the um, we're always going to use the English versions. It's not English. I don't know what to call it, but we're going to use the the standard letter versions of those for our statistics. Does that make sense? That'll help you figure it out too. Okay. Jose wants to know if exercise increases happiness. He recruits thirty participants. Fifteen are asked to exercise daily. And the other 15 are asked not to exercise at all. After two weeks, Jose asks each participant to take a five item survey that measures happiness. So what's our dependent variable? It's happiness, yes. Reliability is blank. Validity is blank. The correct answer is C. Reliability is repeatability and validity is accuracy. Okay. Ratio measures. Oh no. What? Don't forget the back. You forgot the back? Yeah, I did. Okay. Bef do you want to answer those really quick? Yes. Yeah, you I'm get so one sorry. minute. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I even told you don't forget the back. <laughs> It's okay. My brain has left my head. Like once we start getting to the end of the week, my brain kind of leaves my body. And on Friday, I can say the most ridiculous things. But yeah, try to be pretty quick with these. Remember too, it's only five points. In the grand scheme of things, your paper counts for a lot more. <laughs> it's like over 300 points. <laughs> By the way, is anybody planning on taking biopsychology next semester? Either you've already done it or you never want to do it. And that's okay. You got to take some biological course with me. You've just got to figure out which one you want it to be. But if you're thinking about taking biopsych next semester, remember that I will be on sabbatical. We are still going to offer it as an online option. But if you want to take biopsychology, you need to shoot me an email in the next month or so. You'll need to talk to Bill and you might need to add that class. You might need to talk to Bill before registration even opens. So let me know by October if you're thinking about biopsych. If you're not, it doesn't hurt my feelings. Some people don't want to learn about brains and that's okay. It takes all kinds. but. If you're interested, let me know. We are going to have an option for you because we have too many biology students and health and biomedical science students that need that class for me to not offer it. Okay, Jasmine? All on number 10. Hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> so I try not to do time tests. When I was in second grade, we used to do time tests for addition and subtraction. And I hated those. I am not good with time pressure. I'm still not good with time pressure. And I owe it all to my, like, and my second grade teacher was awesome. But I hated those time tests. I love you, Mrs. Joe. Wherever you are now, you were a great teacher. Okay, are you good? Yeah. All right. Let's go back. So ratio measures. B, have a meaningful zero. The zero actually implies a lack of something. 
Okay, Gromit, we're going to assume it's the Gromit from Wallace and Gromit. Gromit asks participants about their political affiliation. Participants can mark either liberal or conservative. What type of measure is this? It's nominal. We're using names, they're mutually exclusive, and we're not referring to any numerical value whatsoever. Okay, which of the following statements is false? Yes, don't ever do this. If you do research and you try to do this, I'm going to look at you like this. Really? Come on. Oh, sorry, I should have had my mask on when I talked, my bad. Okay, so B, you do not wanna do this. Once a study is complete, it is best to report only the interesting results. Otherwise, science gets boring. Bold of them to assume that any results that came out of my study would be considered interesting by anyone, but okay. <laughs> but yes, report everything, even if it doesn't tell as compelling of a state, report everything. Okay, which of the following is false? What now? Hmm? Yeah, this, okay. So it can't be all of those things are false. Um, it's B, y'all. Sometimes getting a random sample is impossible. If you don't have a list of all members of the population, you're not gonna be able to get a random sample. So like I said, if you're doing a lot of work in cognitive psychology, for example, and you're interested in people in general, um, the correct answer, by the way, is B. The correct answer is B. I'm explaining why it's not C, because it's because C is actually true. Sometimes we can't get a random sample. Did you have a question? Yeah, we were wrong. Is it a zero? Or just it's point five. It's minus point five. Half a point. That's it. There are ten questions. It's five points. So everything is half a point. So the correct answer here is B. Convenience sampling is the best way to obtain a sample that's representative of the population. Now, you know that's not true, but confidence intervals do assume random samples and random sampling is either going to be very difficult or impossible because you do actually need the list of the entire population to do it. Okay, final question. In a recent study, participants were asked to keep a daily journal. Some participants were asked to use their journal to count their blessings for the day. The rest were asked to use their journal to record all the hassles that bothered them that day. After several weeks of journaling, all participants reported on their level of happiness. What type of study is this? Um, it's going to be C, yes. So we have, we actually are manipulating something here now. I would like more detail for this to be a true experiment. We don't know if people were randomly assigned, of course, but we're going to assume for argument's sake that they were. Yeah, I was going to say, if I had to do a journal where I reported everything that ticked me off, I would be such an angry person if I had to remember every single instance. So how are we feeling? Is there anything that we need to go over? Is there any question that you still don't quite understand that you'd like us to talk a little bit more about? Jasmine, you look like you're thinking. I okay, are you sure? So is everybody feeling pretty good? Everybody knows why they missed what they missed and hopefully you didn't miss too much. I hope you didn't miss too much. Oh yeah, Clelia. Pre-registration would be an instance where you're telling people about the study that you're planning to do ahead of time. You haven't actually conducted anything yet. You're telling people what you want to do ahead of time. Here, they've already conducted the study, so we're asking what type of research it is. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah, Jasmine. Can you remember one more time um, the difference between our experimental and experimental? Yes. Okay, so yes. So. An experimental study requires you to either directly manipulate or assign people to different conditions, right? So for example, let's go back to this journaling study. 
So we're going to look at whether keeping track of things to be grateful for or things that ticked you off affect happiness, right? So that's the idea that what you focus on is what affects your mood. That's kind of the hypothesis here. So if you focus on the things that you're grateful for, the idea is that it's going to make you happier. The things that you uh, that made you mad, they're going to make you angrier or less happy. Do you kind of get the idea? So in an experimental study, we are going to randomly assign people to either one of those groups. Everybody has an equal chance of being included in those two different groups. So are you following so far? So here's the thing. I am directly manipulating. I am directly manipulating what people have to focus on in their journal, right? And so if I'm doing random assignment, if I'm randomly assigning people, I know that there probably aren't confounds. So is anybody here kind of a negative person? Hey, no judgment if you are. Like I said, it takes all kinds. Who's a pretty positive person? Yeah, we know Dr. Gilchrist, absolutely. Um, who's kind of in the middle? So the idea is that everybody is going to vary in terms of their mood ahead of time, right? So that's why random assignment works pretty well, because somebody's pre-existing temperament is going to be a confound, right? So the idea is that if I randomly assign people and everybody has an equal chance of being included in the blessings group or the irritations group or the hassles group, that everybody's general temperament will average out. There will be people in the gratitude group who are negative people. There will be positive people and neutral people. And the same will be true for the other group. So we're going to try to cancel out those differences. That way, if we find that the people who had to focus on the things they were grateful for end up being happier than the hassle group, we'll know because we manipulated it ourselves and we did random assignment that this was a causal effect. So we can actually say that what you focus on causes a change, um, causes a change in your mood. So to borrow a phrase from a, a techno song that I really, really like, where your focus goes, your energy flows, that kind of idea. Now, so that's experimental research. We do direct manipulation. We do random assignment to rule out other potential variables so we get a cause-effect relationship. Non-experimental research will lack one of those features. Either you're not manipulating anything or you're not doing random assignment. So I'm being really general here. Like I said, for the sake of argument for question 10, we're assuming random assignment, but if we weren't, it would not be a true experiment. It would be possibly a quasi-experiment because we didn't randomly assign people and we can't rule things out. But non-experimental research will not have that manipulation. We would just be like, okay, we're going to get some happy people. We want you to focus on your blessings. You ticked off people. We want you to focus on your hassles and we're going to see how happy you are later because you didn't manipulate anything you don't actually know if it's a true cause effect relationship. And if you're still struggling with that, you know, you can always come and talk to me and we can talk some more about it, but does that help a little bit? Any other questions? No, no. Well, if you do email me or come talk to me, that goes for all of you. Okay. So did everybody have an opportunity oh, before we begin? No, I'm not using Microsoft Edge. Microsoft Edge is for suckers. <laughs> yeah, I said it. <laughs> Microsoft Edge is for suckers. You can quote me on that. I'm sorry, I was burned too many times by Internet Explorer. I use Firefox in my house. I'm only using Chrome because it's the only other option here. Don't you tell me invalid. Let's try that again. Okay, there we go. I have a really long string of words that is my password and it's very, very particular. Okay, 
So really quick, I just wanted to show you a couple of different things. So kind of depending on where we get today, I might permanently move the quizzes to uh, Thursday because now we're kind of knocked off by one day because I canceled class last week. Um, but I did have a couple of announcements for you. Um, so first of all, I wanted to show you this. No, not the assignments page. We're going to the syllabus and course documents page. I have already uploaded your chapter three handout, which is due next Thursday. So I'm gonna load that up. So this is pretty straightforward. You're gonna have to do some math, but it's very basic math. You knew it was coming, but I'll walk you through it. So. Um, this is going to be pretty straightforward. So what you're going to have to do here, um, you're going to need to calculate your mean, your median, and your mode for this sample that we have of quiz scores. Then you're going to need to calculate the standard deviation, the range, and what's called the interquartile range. And this right here is designed to help you calculate the standard deviation and the variance. Okay? And we'll talk about how to do that. So hopefully it won't be too difficult. Um, I will be uh, starting my study sessions this Sunday. So I will be at the student lounge at seven o'clock on Sunday night. And you can join me if you wish. Um, if nobody shows up by 7.15, I'm leaving. <laughs> um, if, you, if you can't be there by 7.15, but you still want me to show up, shoot me an email and I'll make sure I'm around at the time that you need. Okay, so here's another announcement. So I've mentioned that I am not going to my conference um, because my conference got shifted into a virtual conference. So no New Orleans for Dr. Gilchrist, which is probably for the best. They're gonna be dealing with Ida cleanup and hopefully, hopefully it's not too bad. Um, I am also not going to Florida in October, so you're not going to miss any class from that. However, I got roped into, and I don't mind, like I say roped into, like I was tricked. I was not tricked. I did this of my own free will and also because we need it. Um, I got roped into going to an assessment conference. It is virtual but I am expected to be there for all of that period. And that does include one class for this class in September, closer toward the end of the month in the last two weeks. So I'll get more information on these dates, but here's what this means for you. I'm gonna record our session ahead of time. You don't have to come to class. Um, I will probably have you uploading your quiz or your homework if it's if it's going to be a Thursday, which it will be. So I'll have you, I'll give you options to upload those. And you don't have to come to class. You just have to watch the video. So I'm really sorry to do this on you uh, with such short notice, but nobody was able to go to the assessment conference and somebody needs to <laughs> because Shockingly enough, assessment is actually really important. We want to make sure you're actually learning things when you're in college. <laughs> so I have to go to that, but it does mean one less session with you and one more that will be recorded. So I am sorry that I have to do that, but I'm sure you will appreciate the break. So it kind of works both ways. If you're in drugs and behavior, I'm sorry, you're not missing any classes. Like all the other classes miss one session except for drugs and behavior. Sorry, y'all. But honestly, we have fun in drugs and behavior. So yeah. Okay, so that's kind of what I wanted to let you know. I will let you know about those dates next week. Um, so did anybody try to download ESCII onto their computer? How did it go? I'm not even sure if I pushed the right button. Did you enable macros? You need to enable macros if they ask. You need to enable macros. That is like the, yeah, enable macros. That's kind of the key. That's, and that's, yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's all on Excel. That's why you have to enable a macros. So, so one of the cool things about Excel, 
you can actually do a lot of amazing stuff with Excel that you would have never thought possible. My doctoral advisor is an Excel wizard. I learned from him. I learned it from watching you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show you a little bit of ESCII. If you were watching this on video, um, obviously it's gonna be really, I think I actually can pop onto ESCII by using e-learning. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to see that. Um, but today we're going to talk about picturing and describing your data. And we are, take a deep breath with me, breathe in, breathe out. We are going to start with some basic low level statistical calculations. You already know how to calculate a mean, how to figure out a median, and how to figure out a mode. So hopefully none of this is new. So don't get freaked out when you see the scary formulas. <laughs> okay, so here's what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about different ways to visualize your data. We're going to talk about measures of location, so where your distribution is located, where most of your data points are, or what we refer to as measures of central tendency. We will also talk about measures of the spread of your distribution, which is called dispersion. Now, here's what's really critical. We'll talk about what individual data looks like in the context of these distributions. So we are going to talk a little bit about outliers. And then we'll look at some good and bad data pictures. So remember how last semester I showed you a lot of spurious correlations? People who died by being tangled in their bed sheets was correlated with like how many times we've been to the moon or something like that. I'm gonna show you bad graphs and we're gonna talk about why they're bad. If you can find bad graphs, feel free to share them with me. I always like sharing what y'all dig up. Okay, so we're gonna start pretty straightforward. We're gonna talk about how to visualize your data. And I did give you the notes in full. Okay, so. One of the big things that you should absolutely do when you're looking at your data is to actually get a graph or a visualization of your data. So I, one of the nice things about kind of having a background in research is that just by looking at graphs of data, I have a pretty good idea of what the major findings are going to be. And I don't necessarily, I mean, I'm gonna look at the scary numbers to follow up and the scary statistics to follow up. But if you have a good graph or a good visualization, you do not necessarily need to read the entire paper. Like a graph, a good graph is everything. So statistical inference, when we're talking about how representative our sample is of the population and we want to draw conclusions about our population from our sample data, you need to make a lot of judgments about the data that you've collected. And this means you need to actually look at it. So to quote Patrick Starr, look at it, look at it. I want all of you to look at it. That is one of my favorite episodes, by the way. SpongeBob's breath is bad and he thinks it's, that he's ugly. <laughs> I'm sorry, I won't let my ugly face ruin your enjoyment of the movie. <laughs> I can't believe that SpongeBob has been out for over 20 years. I was in like senior year of high school when it first came out. It was something to fun to watch between college classes. <laughs> okay, so informative data pack pictures are going to help you understand your data's distribution. You need to look at the scale of your data, the location of your data, the spread of your data, and the shape of your data. So here's kind of an example. So 
this, um, so I'm going to remind you of this again. Do you remember last semester when we kind of talked about whether taking notes by laptop or taking notes by pen and paper transcription was better for memory? So we're going to come back to this study a lot. So what you're looking at here um, is study number one from Mueller and Oppenheimer. And just to give you a reminder, because I know Jasmine wasn't here with us when we went over this. So the basic idea is that um, participants were randomly assigned to one of two conditions. They either had to take notes with a laptop computer or they had to take notes with a pen and a paper. And they watched a TED talk. And then from that TED talk, they were asked both conceptual questions. So making sure that they understood major concepts um, that from the talk. And they were also asked basic factual information, just regurgitating what they heard in the talk. And Mueller and Oppenheimer basically found that the groups weren't really different from each other in terms of the factual content, but in terms of the conceptual content, the pen and paper group tended to be better at remembering those concepts and they remembered them for a longer period of time. So the idea is that when you can type quickly and when you're typing notes on a laptop, you can write really, really quickly. And that leads you to being more likely to get the verbatim message that somebody is trying to tell you. So you're going to be able to get almost everything that I'm saying right now word for word. But if you're writing with pen and paper, you're not going to be able to write that fast. So you're going to basically try to get the overall gist or you're gonna to try to reinterpret what you're hearing in a way that you can understand. So it's more likely that you're gonna get verbatim messages if you type, you're going to interpret what you hear if you're writing. So that's kind of the idea. So what you're looking at here uh, is what is called a stacked dot plot. And along this X axis, we have the percentage of people that transcribe. So looking at the notes, how much of our laptop group did verbatim transcription? That's all we're looking for here. So did they transcribe what was being said word for word? And then the height of each point tells you how many people did that. So we've got 31 people here. And what you're kind of seeing is that shockingly enough, there's not a lot of verbatim transcription going on with our laptop group. Notice that most people are kind of falling between a little bit below 10% transcription all the way up to about 20. And we do have some people who aren't doing verbatim transcription at all. And we have people who are doing up to 35% transcription over a third of the notes that they are taking are verbatim. So you can actually learn something about this data and the distribution from what you have here. So if I kind of trace a line here, I'm not going to pick yellow because it's not going to show up. And I apologize in advance. My drawing is going to be really bad because I don't have a mouse. I'm doing this with my finger. So the data kind of looks a little bit like this, doesn't it? Like the highest part of the data is right here. It shouldn't have dropped off that much, but it's got a really, really long tail because of some of those outliers. That was really bad drawing. I'm embarrassed for myself. But these, these kinds of data plots can actually help us out a lot. So when you are looking at the data, it turns out you actually have a lot of different options on how you can display that data. I'm going to show you later in this lecture how you can do that in ESCII. But these are some of the different things that ESCII can do. So here, I know it's kind of hard to see. So what you're looking at here, notice that what I have done is a little bit different from the stacked dot plot that I showed you before. So this one's stacked. Here's what it looks like when it's not stacked. So the data looks a little different. You can still see where, get out of the way. Can I move it? I think I can. Oh my gosh, that's so much better. Okay, so here you can kind of see the 
same kind of idea where the majority of the data is between just below 10 and just above 20, but it's harder to kind of get that frequency per percentage, right? So this is one way to look at it. This is where the bulk of the data is. This is a simple dot plot. Here, it, so this is our dot plot. We can also do a stacked dot plot. I tend to prefer the stacked dot plot to the simple dot plot. And then we also have what is called a histogram. Now I do histograms a lot when I'm looking at response time data. I wanna see where the majority of my participants are responding. So this is what's called a histogram. And it's basically kind of like the stacked dot plot where we plot how many people uh, or our frequency, our count against transcription percentage. So notice here, this is what's called a nine bin histogram. So there are nine bins. All of the data is basically divided into these bins. So by data, I mean the transcription percentages. So basically we have a uh, bar for any data between zero and three. So here we have one person. And there they are in our stack dot plot. We have two people that are just below five. So any data that's between three and six, we have two of those. Then we have data between six and nine, nine and 12, 12 and 15%, 15 and 18%, 18 to 21, 21 to 24, 24 to 27, uh, 27 to 30, 30 to 33, 33 to 36 and 36 and up. So what I like about histograms, look how similar it looks to our stacked dot plot, right? It shows us exactly what we see in the stacked dot plot. The majority of the data and the transcription uh, percentage is between 15 and 18%. That's where most of our data lies. The problem with histograms is, you get to decide how many bins you want to have. So how many bins we show for the data is up to you. So here's a histogram with 12 bins. Go away for a second. Now you can still kind of see the data that you're seeing in that stack dot plot, but it's a little bit different, isn't it? So notice that our outliers don't really look like outliers anymore. So here, are people that are kind of getting 20 over 25% up to 35%, you can kind of see them here. They're outliers. Here, they don't look like outliers like they used to. So histograms can be really good, but figuring out how many bins you want can be a challenge. You might have to try out different ones to appropriately characterize what you want your distribution to look like. Okay. So really quick, I am gonna show you how to do this in ESCII before we go on. So we, we, can, we can avoid the scary numbers just for a little bit. And I'm not making fun of you when I call them scary numbers. I know that people have math anxiety. Math anxiety is real. And especially if you're female, like our culture has got really weird ideas about who can and can't do math. And that's not your fault. <laughs> but I kind of want to go back so I can show you how you can recreate these in SE. Okay. No, academics. Now you watch, I'm going to hit the back button and it's going to kick me out. That is the one thing I very deeply dislike about e-learning. Okay, so we go to the syllabus and course documents. So if you wanna learn how to mess around with these different data styles, you're gonna to wanna to pick ESCII chapters three through eight. So I'm gonna open that up. Now for this to work, you need to enable macros. Okay, so enable editing, I'm good with that. Enable content. So here it says macros have been disabled. This will not work if you've disabled macros. So go ahead and enable content. So um, I'm going to show you a little bit of this here. I'm going to zoom in because I know it's kind of hard to see from back here. Uh, if you'd like to try this on your laptop, you're welcome to follow along. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and zoom. 
We're gonna fit our selection. Oh my gosh, that's too big. <laughs> I'm scared now. Let's try 100% and see what it, okay, 100's too big. Let's try 200. Okay, I can work with this. So here's, and, and I, what I really like about this, they also describe what these tabs are. So we have describe, which is chapter three, normal distribution, which is chapters three and four. So this is all about the normal distribution, comparing the normal distribution to the T distribution, confidence intervals, p-values. Um, we're going to look at effect size and paired designs and things like that. But for right now, you just need to go into the tab that's called describe. So here's our transcription data that we've been looking at. So here's what's kind of cool about this. So here we have our data set name, we have the units, and we have the conditions. So this is transcription with the laptop. Um, so what's neat about this is that this is what is already on this page. We could enter in our own data and clear all of this and look at our own data, or you can paste in data from something else. So you don't just have to use ESCII for this class. If you want to look at some data, you can simply paste this in or clear your data and type your own data in. And we'll probably do that once I get the data from our uh, replication study. Um, because of the four day week and because I kind of had a rough week last week, I haven't done as much with the booklets as I'd like, but I plan to do a little bit more tomorrow. We should definitely have the replication study run by the end of the month. That's my promise. Um, so here's a couple of different things. So notice if you go down to box three, we have a section for descriptive statistics. So we can do a few different things. If I click show values, it actually has already calculated the mean of my data, the median of my data, the standard deviation and quartiles. If you don't know what quartiles are yet, that is okay. We will talk about that. Here's something else that's kind of cool. You can actually show where the mean is in your data. So the mean is gonna be represented by this little triangle. So here is where our mean is. Notice that in this particular case, the mean of our transcription data is not quite where the bulk of our data is. Most of our data is above 15%, but our mean is 14.5%. So our data is a little skewed. Our median can also be shown for us. So if we click on that checkbox, notice that our median is actually even lower than our mean. Our median is about 12.8%. Um, and then we also have standard deviation, which is shown with this little line with the X's, but we'll kind of talk about those later. This kind of shows you what one standard deviation is. So here's our center. This is one standard deviation from the mean. Notice that uh, these two data points here, those high values are more than two, are more than one standard deviation from the mean. So they're pretty uncommon. All right. So uh, let me get rid of the median and the mean. We'll talk more about those later. But look, we also have a stacked dot plot. So if you go down to box eight, just below your histogram, we have a dot plot. You can choose to stack the dots, or if you uncheck the box, you get an unstacked dot plot. So what you choose is up to you. Now, really quick, you can also change the number of bins for your histogram. So here's what our data looks like with 12 bins. Somebody give me a very, very low number, please. I can't have one bin. You've got to give me more than one. Four bins. Okay. So watch what happens to my distribution when I get rid of all the bins. It's still a pretty good, uh, it's still a pretty good like it tells you where the majority of the data is, but notice that it's almost oversimplified and it doesn't really seem to capture the complexity that our stacked up plot does. Now let's pick a really high number. 25, 26 bins. <laughs> Actually, let's make it more. Watch this. I'm going to make 50. I can only make 30. 
look at how I've lost a good chunk of the complexity. Like it's almost too complex and it doesn't really show us a lot of our distribution. So the number of bins that you choose to use is up to you. It's always up to you. So that's our first little entry into ESCII. That wasn't too bad, was it? Good. It's going to do most of the hard work for you. Now, I am occasionally going to show you formulas. I am occasionally going to make you do things by hand. However, I prefer, like, we have wonderful technology that can do most of these calculations for us very easily. I care more that you understand what the numbers mean than how to calculate them. Okay. So let's say that we're looking at two very different types of data here. So visualizing your data can actually show you some interesting things. So here we've got two different pictures of distributions. We have distribution A and distribution B. So one of the first things that you need to ask if you have a picture of your data is where is most of my data? So here we have data between 20 and 80, and the same is true for B. But if we look at the locations of where most of those data are, they're very, very different. In A, most of the data is in the 30s. In B, most of it is between 60 and 70. And notice too, and we'll get to this later, notice that B has data that's a bit more spread out. So one of the ways that we quantify where the bulk of our data is, is using mean. So getting our average, the median, where 50% of our data is, or the 50th percentile, and then mode, which is the most frequent value. The other thing that we need to look at when we are looking at data besides location is looking at the spread. How spread out is my data? Now notice that the spread between these two pictures is different. So in A, our scores are actually spread out as low as about 25 and about as high as 40. That's about 15 points. On the other hand, notice that the spread for B is nearly double that with about a difference of 30 points. So we can use different things to quantify spread. We can use standard deviation. We can use variance, which is standard deviation squared. We can use our range, and we can use what is referred to as an interquartile range. All right, everybody good? Anybody need some more time? Lelia, you need some more time? Okay. Isabel, you need more time? I can't, I can't see, so, okay. So here's the thing. We have a lot of different ways that we can measure the location and the spread. Some of them will work better than others depending on what it is you wanna look at. So one of the things that you need to first think carefully about when you're talking about these measurements is compare the theoretical range to the actual range. So our theoretical range is the measure of what, it, the range of what's possible. So the theoretical range is for something like accuracy or transcription accuracy, um, zero to a hundred percent. Either they're not transcribing verbatim at all, or they can transcribe up to a hundred percent. If they can transcribe verbatim up to a hundred percent, I want to meet those people. They have much better memory than me, and I'd like to study them. Um, now, an actual range is going to be different. The range 
the range, your actual range is gonna be a little bit different. That is the minimum and the maximum scores that is obtained. So we're gonna take our maximum score and subtract the minimum score from it. So here, that would be subtracting 40, our highest score from about 25, or here, almost 80 to just a little under 50. So we're going to basically subtract our lowest score from our highest score. The range is probably usually going to be smaller than your theoretical range. Okay, so when you are looking at your data pictures, now this is a case where the data is not actually following the rule. Here, the data goes between 20 and 80. If the theoretical range is zero to 100, you need to show the entire theoretical range. Don't just start your, don't just start your graph off or your scale to where the data actually starts. Have it where your theoretical range is. So if you're looking at data on a one through seven scale, the lowest part of your scale needs to be one, the highest part of your scale needs to be seven, even if nobody responded to one or seven. So I've seen a couple of graphs, and if you've had intro to psych with me, you might remember me occasionally looking at a graph in your textbook and going, this is a really bad graph. It doesn't start at zero. <laughs> and I'm not saying that every graph has to start at zero, but if zero is the beginning point of your theoretical range, your graph needs to include zero, always. <laughs> All right. And additionally, if you're wanting to compare between the two, make the scales the same. And I think I am going to show you an example of a bad graph right now. Like some of this is going to turn into a, a little soapbox lecture about graphs that Dr. Gilchrist does not like. <laughs> I'll try to keep it short. Nobody cares about the ranting but me. <laughs> okay, so this is a graph that actually, so once you're done writing this down, let me know. This is a graph that actually pops up in our intro to psych textbook when we're talking about sleep deprivation. And I record the textbook on audio for people. So I see the textbook all the time and this graph is fresh in my mind. One of the examples they give of sleep deprivation is they look at how many accidents happen in the time change that we typically have in the fall when we fall back. And we have our time change when we spring forward in the spring and we lose an hour. And so they always show this graph that shows more accidents, but I'm gonna show you why it's a really bad graph, okay. I can't not, it's just so bad, y'all. All right. Images. Oh, I know that graph's gotta be there somewhere. Wait. Accidents, daylight saving. Oh, where's the graph? Where's the graph? It's such a bad graph. Okay. Where is it? Uh, actually, actually, this is this is it. This is pretty much it. So this is a terrible graph. I'm gonna zoom in so you can see how bad this graph is. And here's why it's just a bad graph. So notice. So at the bottom of our accident scale, I know it's really hard to see. So this is the spring shift. 
it starts at 2400 in the fall shift it starts at 3600 and they're setting this up to show that there are way more accidents after the spring time change than not but here's the thing we're looking at two very different scales if we actually scaled these together this would look very very different so notice here immediately after the spring shift it goes to 2800 here it drops down to 3800 now most people will focus on the fact that it dropped compared to here and that is important but if we're wanting to compare spring versus fall they're not comparable they're on completely different scales and it's deliberately distorting the data to make this look worse than it is and let's be clear that increase from like 20 like 2500 or so all the way to 2800 is bad but it's still not as bad as the number of accidents after our fall time change that feels like it is deliberately misrepresenting the data in that graph and that's the graph I hate. You're welcome. <laughs> I, like, I get what they're trying to do, but the scale is all wrong and it just hurts to look at that. That's bad practice. I don't ever want you to do something like that. And you are going to have to make a graph for your paper. Don't do that. <laughs> okay. Most graph soft and, and here's the other thing, most of your graph software is going to zoom in just to show you the range. You can actually modify the range on your graph in Excel, so make sure you can do that. If you don't know how to do that, come and talk to me. Um, I learned from an Excel wizard. <laughs> that is my claim to expertise. Dr. Gilchrist, she learned from an Excel wizard. Okay. So in addition to location and spread, we can also focus on the shape. So what do you notice about C versus D? How many peaks are there in C? There's, there's one. Here's, here's kind of where our peak is right here. Now, this is kind of rising, but in general, we could think of this as kind of one giant peak. So we're talking about global peaks, not these little local peaks. Notice here in D, we got one peak here, we got one peak here. This is what's called a bimodal distribution because there are two equally frequently occurring values. So when we're talking about the shape, we're talking about how many peaks there are. So here, we could kind of argue that this is what we call a unimodal distribution. It has one peak. This is a bimodal distribution. You can very easily see two peaks. And then we can have a multimodal distribution, which typically will have two or more peaks. Now, multiple modes will often indicate uh, distinct groups. So if we imagine this was height, we would know that one of those peaks represents uh, people who are fem or one who for women and one for men in that case. Now, obviously I know it's more complicated than that, but that's just one example. Now, these are going to apply to broad trends. So I kind of mentioned that here, this looks like a broad peak, but if we wanna focus on local peaks, we can. In this case, if we're focusing on this and this and this, we might actually say that it's multimodal. It depends on what you are looking at. You're gonna to have to use your best judgment here. So generally, initially, you should try to ignore like little small peaks and valleys you should look at the overall general broad view of the data but one of the things that will help you get better at judging the modality of your distribution is just get comfortable with data
Sorry, I got some I got some good news. So I do a happy dance. Okay. So one of the other things that we can kind of talk about are the shape of our data. In addition to talking about the peaks and the modality, we can talk about how symmetrical our data is. Does anybody need me to go back? Okay. So A and B are pretty symmetrical, aren't they? They look even on both sides of the peak. There's as much data above the mode as below. The data that I showed you from the transcription was pretty was kind of symmetrical, but it had two long tails. Now, when we talk about data that is not symmetrical, take a look at this. This kind of looks a little bit like our transcription data, where we have a long, long tail to the right. This is what we would call a positive skew. Positive skew occurs when you have extra data above the mode. Negative skew is the opposite. It's going to have a long tail out to the left of most of your data. And in this case, you have more data below your peak. So the peak of the data is here, but you've got this long tail stretching out to the left. That would be what we call negative skew. Now we're not really gonna talk about skew very much. If you're interested in learning about skew, one of the ways that we measure it is with a term called kurtosis. It's just a fun word to say. I will not expect you to actually tell me how kurtotic a distribution is. Now, skew will often happen because of selection data. So basically having minimum entrance requirements or admissions requirements or minimum test scores or things like that. All right, anybody need some more time? Okay, so one of the things that you can kind of see here is that pictures, getting a picture can actually tell you a lot about your data. Um, so pictures are really helpful. You should include pictures and figures in your papers when you're writing things up. People want to see your data, but you're also going to want to have numbers. So I think uh, I will stop here. So next time we will talk about using descriptive statistics. So we're going to stop here. So the numbers that we're going to talk about for next time our mean, median, and mode. Those are gonna help us figure out where the majority of our data is. Spread, we're gonna look at standard deviation, variance, range, and interquartile range. And then we'll talk about skew. We're not gonna cover it here. Again, I kind of mentioned the way you measure skew is with something called kurtosis. So we'll start diving into numbers next time. If you need to, bring a calculator or bring some scratch paper to work on because we are gonna be doing some stuff by hand next time. And I will walk you through all of it and we'll work through it together. If you would like to get a jump on your homework, I will be at the study session Sunday at the student lounge at seven. Lots of essays. All right, everybody, have a wonderful weekend. See you next time.